Okay, good evening. Tonight is our weekly meditator Dhamma talk. So I wanted to talk tonight about vipassana. Vipassana. Someone recently asked on a, a f on, on the internet. Someone was asking, "How do you practice vipassana?" So I wanted to talk about vipassana. How do you practice vipassana? There's, there's other questions as well. Uh, should we practice vipassana? That's an interesting question. Why should we practice vipassana? Why should we care how you practice vipassana? Should we be practicing it? It's a question that you should answer right off because... Well, it's hard to practice if you have doubts about what you're doing. But other questions. Uh, what does it mean? What does vipassana mean? And so I'd like to answer several questions about it. First, in regards to... I'm not going to go into detail, I don't think, about why we should practice it. I'm going to assume that some of that work has already been done or will be done, if not, uh, in, in some of the other things I say. But I'd, I'd, I was once told by a monk that Vipassana was a later invention. So the question of what is Vipassana is, is immediately immediately relative. Uh, relevant. Sorry. He said that vipassana. Was, what is vipassana? It's a later invention. And he said the the word vipassana doesn't exist in the Tipitaka. And it quite shocked me to hear this. And so I went and looked it up. The question: you know, Did the Buddha actually teach vipassana? And so we, the, we have to understand. First of all, let's let's go directly to what it means. Vipassana means to see clearly. Vi means clearly, passana means seeing. In Sanskrit they say vidarshana, I think, or vipassana. In, in, in Sri Lanka they say vidarshana, which I assume comes from the Sanskrit. This is because passana and dasana are the same word. And that bit of trivia might not sound interesting, but it is important because vipassana isn't a buzzword, and we shouldn't ever reduce things to to labels, right? To a buzzword, the label is useful, but it's what's behind. It's the reality behind it, and reality doesn't have labels. And labels just point us to the reality. So it means seeing clearly, and then if we ask generally, did the Buddha teach seeing, teach us seeing, to teach us to see clearly? I think anyone who who says no doesn't have a very good idea of the Buddha's teaching at all. The Buddha used the word dasana, pasana, and then the verbal forms, das, uh, pasati is a common one. But he did use the word vipassana. He didn't use it that often, the form. But he did use the the actual form of that word, vipassana. Usually um, when paired with samatha. He said that these two things are sort of form the basis of practice. They're the, the, the two most important qualities. Samatha means tranquility and vipassana means seeing clearly. 
and said, uh, Imam Sutta, he said some people practice one first, samatha first, and then vipassana, so they calm the mind and then they practice insight. Other people practice insight first, and then as they go, the mind becomes calm. Some people practice them together. But the word vipassana, the idea of seeing clearly, is, is all throughout the Buddha's teaching. Uh, a very common example, and an example of how you could miss it if you're not conversant with the Pali, because the English translations don't often say, you know, they, they don't make it clear that that's what's being referred to. But we have a, a very influential sutta, the Padekarata Sutta, where the Buddha says, Adita nanvakameya napatikankeya nagatam. Don't go back to the past, don't worry about the future. What's in the past is gone, what's in the future hasn't come. And then he says, which means whatever dhammas uh, are present, are in the present. Tata tata vipassati, see clearly vipassati, or he sees clearly, or one sees clearly in them, in regards to them. And so we have an example here of, of how the Buddha used this term uh, in, in a, a most important. This was one of the one very important uh, discourse of the Buddha. He specifically pointed out what we should do. We should try and see clearly things, dhammas, in the present moment. So we can answer at least that far about why we should practice, or should we practice, or should we not want to learn about it. Because it was some, it was what the Buddha taught us to do. If you have any kind of idea that the Buddha knew what he was talking about, which you should, if you know anything about his teachings, they make they're quite profound. Then you can uh, appreciate the importance of these words. That clearly seeing seeing clearly is obviously something important. But more generally, Just understanding that it means to see the present moment clearly is such a profound statement. Whereas we get caught up in the past and we worry about the future and we stress and suffer so much from that. If only we could just see reality clearly as being the present moment, right? It would be much more peaceful. Live in the present, right? And not only live in the present, the Buddha didn't just say that, he said, see clearly. And not just see clearly the present, but see clearly the dhammas that arise in the present. Or the dhammas that there are in the present. So we still haven't answered how we practice vipassana, but we've gotten some idea of what is meant by vipassana. So we start here looking at this. This is a good example of where we can look. We say, okay, you practice vipassana. You find some way to uh, see the present dhammas clearly. And if we look, if, if we go, I'll try and trace this back. If you, if you look at where the Buddha talked about seeing the dhammas in the present moment, you have another very important uh, verse that the Buddha taught where he says sabbe dhamma anatta all dhammas are non-self sabbe dhamma anatta ti he says yada panya yapasati when one sees this panyaya with wisdom And if you listen carefully, you hear what I said. Yada panyaya pasati. So again, he's using the word pasati, which is vipassana, which is pasana. When one sees 
panyaya with wisdom with panya atani bindati dukhe and one becomes disenchanted with suffering esa esa mago visuddhya this is the path of purification so why we should practice it is right there that it leads to purity which is a very valuable quality The idea being that when you see things clearly, there's a purity that's there, that's not that's absent, that we're not able to attain when we don't see clearly. Because our habits, the way we look at things, the way we're accustomed to looking at things, is fraught with all sorts of ignorances and, and misunderstandings. So wanting to find happiness, we act in ways and speak in ways and think in ways that cause us suffering but once we see clearly we won't do that we won't react to things in ways that give rise to suffering but the first part is more important for the practice what what is that we should see clearly well here we have a good answer sabbe dhamma anatta and when we look in the present moment at the dhammas, whatever those may be, the Buddha says we, we, what we are to come to see is that they're anatta, that they're not self. And this opens the door up to really the, the base of the Buddha's teaching that Really, our way of looking at the world is flawed in, in, in at least this very fundamental way. You know, the Buddha also talks about impermanence and suffering, but I think the more deeper and, and more important quality is non-self. So the way we look at the world, even things in the present moment, if, I, if you told most people live in the present moment and see clearly the things in the present moment, they would say, okay, things, ah, that thing there, that thing there, that person there, that things that have self. They have self in the sense that they have a name, right? They have an entity to them. They are a thing. They are an object. In fact, if you think about it, they're not actually a thing in the present moment at all. Their thingness requires past and future. Like if you refer to a person by name, well, they're not at that moment that person. The person who they are is the thing that lasts from moment to moment. When you see and hear and smell and taste, and uh, hopefully not all of those, but you see and hear them, when you think about them, but the same with things, everything that you see and hear and smell, these are things that last. And in fact, the only thing that is truly in the present moment is experience. And so why is it, what I say about the base of the Buddha's teaching is again and again the Buddha talked about the six senses, the five aggregates, body, mind, the 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 building blocks of experience. He taught that, that that is the basis of reality. Those are the dhammas. That people, places and things, those are not dhammas. Those are concepts. Those are selves. That's looking at the world from a perspective of what we think of it. Of, of our conception of all the pieces in it. And put things together. And we, we give them names and so on. But when we talk about non-self, it means to see the present moment. So it, it encompasses impermanence and suffering as well, because impermanence is the fact that experiences are momentary. And we start to see that all the things, the people and places that we thought were uh, were real are just made up of experiences 
that, that our reception of everything in the world, what we actually receive is just seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. And so seeing clearly has something to do with this change of perspective from seeing things as selves, as stable, as satisfying. And because the essence is satisfaction. One thing that you start to realize when you practice, when you see clearly, and this is a part of seeing clearly, when we talk about suffering, is it, all it means is that nothing can satisfy you because anything that you thought exists actually is not real your experience of it is momentary your con contact with it is dependent on experiences you can only ever see or hear or smell or taste or feel or think about something and so it can't actually be anything for you more than just experience and when you look at experiences Experiences are not satisfying. Why? Because they're impermanent. Because you can't control them. You can't keep them. You can't keep them away. You can't manage them. And so when our expectations, when we want for things to be a certain way, and they're not that certain way, we suffer. And we build up attachment to things. We get out of out of sync with reality because we don't see clearly. And we start to notice that when we do see clearly, we suffer less. And when we do interact with things as they are rather than how we wish they would be, we suffer less. So part of our practice of seeing clearly has to be seeing in terms of experience. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking, and the physical and mental aspects of reality. And so, when we think about this, if we go the next step and we, we try to think about how did the Buddha teach us to uh, approach experience? And we can start to understand how we can practice to see clearly. What we should start to see as we look at the, these teachings is that you don't really practice seeing clearly. You practice something to see clearly. You have to practice to see clearly. And so to say practicing vipassana is a bit misleading because you don't just, okay, I'm going to practice, I'm just going to see clearly many, many times and that'll be my practice. No, you practice to see clearly. And if you practice correctly, of course, you'll start to see clearly. It, should, it has to be that way. So there's a very another very famous story or talk that the Buddha gave to Bahia. Because Bahia asked the Buddha for the most concise teaching he could give. Bahia had been uh, shipwrecked. He'd been shipwrecked and then cast ashore naked and so he he just covered himself up with a piece of pot or something, pottery or something, and uh, walked around sort of begging for food. And people started to think he, people thought he was uh, maybe some some ascetic because there were a lot of naked ascetics around that time. And so they gave him food, and he thought, oh wow, people giving me food, thinking I'm a naked ascetic. So he started. To uh, to act the part, he said, "Well, then I'll just be a naked ascetic." And people offered him clothes, and he refused the clothes, thinking, "Well, I won't get any support that way." And eventually, people started to think he was somehow enlightened, and he had started to think he was enlightened. And then the story goes that a Brahma, a god who used to be one of his fellow monks in a past life, came down and said, "Bahia, you're not an arahant." You're not enlightened and you're not on the path to enlightenment. He said, go find the Buddha. The Buddha has arisen, go find him. So he, he went to see the Buddha and based on his harrowing journey of almost dying in the ocean, and his realization that, uh, well, he, he wasn't anywhere near enlightened and that there was this idea of being enlightened. He, he just asked for the Buddha for the most simple 
teaching possible. And, and, and that's why it's so important, and I'd say famous, is because it's this concise and very powerful statement. It also explains quite well why we practice the way we do. Because the Buddha said, uh, then train yourself, you should train yourself in, in, in this way, Bahia. Dipte dipta matang bhavisati. What is seen should just be seen. In what is seen, there should just be what is seen. Sutte sutta matang bhavisati. In what is heard, there should just be what is heard. Mutte mutta matang bhavisati. In what is felt, which means smell, taste, felt on the body, there should just be what is felt, what is experienced. Vinyate vinyata matang bhavisati. What is cognized in the mind will just be what is cognized in the mind. And as if you do that, then there will be no. You you won't. Basically, he said you won't get caught up in it. He says something very very cryptic and well terse, I guess. He says tato tuang natena. From that. Uh, or, or there, thereby there will be no you by that or because of that meaning there will be no no me, mine, no self you will not get caught up in those things there will be a simple clear seeing so we get a very important part of the puzzle here a important part of the explanation if you want a clear understanding of what means to practice vipassana to see clearly seeing clearly with wisdom you know the word panya meaning to know fully wisdom can be misleading because of how we use it in the west but the word panya means to know fully, to really know something, right? If you think something, I think um, I think there is life on other planets. No. I think, but I don't know if I think that. But if you go to another planet and then you see other life, then you oh, then you know. Or if they contact us or something, oh, then you know. In the same way I could say, well, I think Australia exists. But until I see it for myself, I don't really know. So panya means to really know. That's, I mean, that's just basically what it means. So if we talk about the Dhammas, it makes a lot of sense to talk about just let seeing be seeing. Because that's really knowing them. And it may seem quite mundane and, and simplistic, but that's actually the point, is that we complicate things. Rather than seeing things clearly, we react and we judge and we complicate and we transform things from what they are to what they're not. So seeing becomes a problem. You, know, you see someone you don't like, or you see something ugly, or you see something beautiful. You know, instead of focusing on the seeing, it becomes the thing, and it becomes the whole story behind the thing, where you see something you like or something you dislike. And then you get off on that, creating all sorts of karma, all sorts of future prospects based not at all on the experience but based on how you perceive it and how you react to it so panya meaning to see something fully or to really see something, to really know something 
to see it with a, a true knowledge of what it is. This is very different from how we normally interact with reality. So we've, we've come close, I think, to answering the question. If we talk about the practice of letting seeing just be seeing. But there's another very important teaching of the Buddha where he says this sort of thing as well. And this is really exactly how we practice, where the Buddha in the Satipatthana Sutta says, Gachanto va gachamiti pajanati. Pajanati is means sees, means or means knows, really knows. It's the same word as panya. Pajanati means panya. Gachanto va gachami. When walking, one knows I am walking or going. When going, one knows I am going. When standing, one knows I am standing. When sitting, one knows I am sitting. When lying down, one knows I am lying down. When feeling anger, one knows I am feeling anger, and so on and so on. When one feels pain, when pain arises, one knows that pain has arisen, and so on. And this is the practice of satipatthana. So what we talk about, as I've said many times, what we practice, how we explain what we practice, <coughs> we explain it as satipatthana vipassana. Satipatthana is what we practice, vipassana is why we practice. We practice satipatthana to see clearly. And so when you hear about using a mantra, call it what you like, using a word to remind yourself when you say to yourself pain, pain, or when you say hearing, hearing, seeing, when you're thinking about something and you say thinking, thinking, when you focus on the object and remind yourself it is what it is, you're trying to cultivate this state of seeing reality just as it is, where seeing is just seeing, hearing is just hearing, and so on. And so how you practice vipassana becomes about how you cultivate this ability to see reality just as it is, to really know what it is. And it changes, it shifts your perception from the people, places, and things, and concepts to experience this. Some people call it penetrative insight. And that's, that's not how this should be translated, I don't think, but it's an interesting idea, because, or it's a useful idea, uh, because it penetrates. We talk about penetrating through the cloud of this nebulous idea of, of people and places and things. It's nebulous because it's all in the mind and it's, it's based very much on our own perceptions. You know, we have ideas of who people are, of what things are. It's based on our preferences and so on. And it's not clearly here and now. It's not really in tune with what's actually happening. In order to actually have these concepts arise, you have to have experience. So it's penetrative in that it really puts you in direct contact with reality, with the present moment, uh, with the Dhamma. And so in brief, Vipassana is, is this um, parting of the clouds of, of, of kind of delusion and darkness and ignorance to see reality just as it is as it, as it comes to us and that is purifying that changes our habits from ones of reactivity to ones of purity and peace clarity And the way we practice this is by being mindful. 
by reminding ourselves, by practicing, by, by cultivating the quality of mind that sees an experience just as it is. Seeing is just seeing, hearing is just hearing, smelling is just smelling. And so by practicing the way we are, even just watching the stomach rising, falling, it's not the stomach we're interested exactly in exactly, it's more the quality of mind with which we look at the stomach. It's just a simple object, but when you look at it, you'll see the reaction, the, the judgment, the forcing of the breath even. And you'll see that all of this baggage that we carry, all of this coloring that we do of the experience. We don't actually interact with it just as it is. We react to it and we uh, influence it by, based on our habit. As you see more and more clearly, this all starts to change. And so we attempt to just see the experience as it is, vipassana. We say to ourselves, with the body we watch the stomach and the foot, with the feelings we say pain, pain, or if you feel happy, saying happy, or calm, calm. With the thought, saying thinking, with the emotions, liking and disliking, and so on. Mind states, senses, seeing, hearing, smelling. When we practice, when we cultivate this, then we start to see more clearly. So, way, the way, so the way we teach, if you concisely want to talk about how you practice vipassana, we teach the practice of using a word that reminds you of the experience, to bring your mind closer to the experience, which will allow you to see clearly, which will purify the mind from all the bad habits that come from not seeing clearly. And that's simply how you practice vipassana. So that's the talk for tonight. Thank you for listening.